Now we are moving to a different realm, a realm that we are all immersed in and we have yet to fully understand. We are extremely fortunate that the University of Haifa is the academic scholar of this, of the academic home of this scholar. A man who is versed in all things online, an expert on information, its systems, and its management. I have the honor to call to stage Professor Shezaf Rafaeli to deliver his lecture titled, Digital Culture Clutter, Life and Death on the Net. Digital culture slash clutter. Uh, the ocean we are already immersed in, and the process that is occurring at a much faster pace than tsunami, is illustrated maybe well enough by this uh, street corner with people reading print newspapers and a horse-drawn buggy, uh, with only a few decades later, that same street corner uh, looking very differently. And it's this transition, this shift, that is of interest to us. It's a shift that we uh, refer to as the fourth industrial revolution. We get excited about the energy, about the opportunities in automation, about cyber, uh, about what is called the fourth industrial revolution. Many of us look at this as a source of making a living. Uh, many of us look at this as a new way of entertaining ourselves. And many of us are concerned. We're concerned about the ill effects or the bad changes, the things that we need to worry about. In general and in summary, one can look at both utopian and dystopian views of this change, of this ocean that we're being dipped into uh, very rapidly. And the question is, given the fact that this word, disruption, is the word that appears most often when people discuss the internet and the digital and the four billion people connected and the two billion people on Facebook and the four or five million queries on Google every minute, and the fact that we now spend much more time looking at screens than we did looking at television, and that, the time we spent watching television was too much. All of this is disruption. The Hebrew word for disruption, iru, sounds like the Hebrew word for contemplation, hiru. And what I'd like to propose is a contemplation of this disruption. I'd like to talk briefly about several research projects that we're involved in namely these four, a research project related to digital gaps, a project related to massive online open courses, work that we're doing in both development and research related to communities and how they talk to each other, and work on wikis and encyclopedias and knowledge sharing. I'd like to talk about these projects in the context of trying to understand the process of being dipped into this ocean with ever rising tides. Because the four billion people connected today are going to morph into five or six or seven billion people connected tomorrow. Because the four million questions or queries answered on Google every minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, are going to morph into 40 million questions answered by Google or their replacements. So to do this, I'm going to talk about these four projects in the context of eight issues. And the eight issues are represented by these eight colorful lines on the right hand of the screen. They're also represented by these eight icons. What I'd like to try to convey is a lattice or a matrix of these eight issues placed across four research projects that we are involved in and work on today. Digital culture slash clutter is about the reason that there's a titter going through the audience, the reason that some people are smiling and some people are murmuring, and most people have a gut reaction to this picture. What is taking place once all of this technology is engulfing us? What can we say about it? And I'd like to propose eight aspects or eight perspectives to think about this connection between new technology and old human existence. And these eight aspects begin with a death of the tangible that gives birth to a death of the printed book. 
I'm going to use the word death a lot, not with a morbid intent, but with the intent of waking you up, with the intent of thinking about what are we losing, what is changing, what is evolving or moving out. So, and notice that I'm questioning each one of these statements. These are not assertions, these are calls for research. Is the tangible really dying and is the book disappearing? Are distance and time and center really dying and what is replacing them? Is the classroom going to disappear and be replaced by something different, by a different mode of doing things? Is our memory that we relied on so heavily up until not long ago no longer that important? Or can we now do without human memory because memory aids are so much better? And if memory is replaced by artificial means, if we can do memory in a manner that is machine driven, is life itself or death itself gone? Is the emergence of the power of algorithms changing our choice and the ability of choice and the availability of choice? And does it have any relationship to our view of truth? Is conversation being affected to a degree where conversation is longer, no longer the main human trait? Is privacy being eroded? And lastly, is the promise of all of this technology, promise of the internet, those of us who've been around since it began, remember all of the hopes pinned on it, is the promise dead as well? The framework of these eight icons and these eight major questions is the field in which our research takes place. It's the field where, uh, here's Hebrew terms for all of this, it's the field where I'd like to place the research projects that we work on. So let me begin with tangibility. The argument that being digital is about bits replacing atoms, the visual or the representation pushing away the physical, that it is information that is now the most important resource and oil or other fossil fuels are maybe taking second place. Is this something that relates directly also to the death of the printed book? And the answer is yes, because if I were to survey you, there would be only a small portion of you who still have printed encyclopedias at home. And those who still have printed encyclopedias at home have them at home because you're too lazy to take them down to the dumpster. And that's not because they were bad solutions. It's because there are other solutions. The printed book is on the decline, not because we read less, we read more. They're on the decline, not because we write less, we write a whole lot more. It's because the idea of the codex, the printed collection of several hundred pages, is no longer as central to our culture as it used to be. And there are alternatives. The book, as we knew it, is moving very rapidly to a place where the scroll now is. Something that we revere, that we cherish, that we hold dear, but is becoming more ceremonial and representative and symbolic than actually functional. For those of you who speak Hebrew, you should know that the demise of the book has some real meaning short term. Because we used to talk about knowledge as Ladat Sefer, to know the book. And if the book is no longer there, what is Ladat Sefer? We talk about ourselves unhumbly as Amma Sefer, the people of the book. Well, who are the people of the book if the book is going away? And we send our, our kids to Beit HaSefer, the house of the book. Where would we send our kids if we no longer cherish the book we used to? Uh, what we have are digital -based, digitally based solutions that are changing the entire sphere of knowledge. Encyclopedias are written by the wisdom of crowds rather than by a select few chosen. Knowledge is being shared on huge platforms in a format that we are only just beginning to learn how to do. Major professions from medicine to programming occur online in joint massive participation project, and that's an area in which we do a lot of research. If anyone is interested, I'll be happy to uh, elucidate further uh, and talk to you about our projects and things we've developed and studies we're doing. But the point is that wikis and encyclopedias and knowledge are no longer shared the way they used to. And we need to learn how to do this correctly. We need to learn about what is being lost. 
So point number one is the point about the demise of the tangible and the demise of the book. Point number two is the death of distance. The fact that how far away you are from something is no longer the determining factor in your value or your abilities. Distance and time are now in a very different place than we, it, they used to be. Synchronicity and asynchronicity have become a lot more elastic. Our ability to deal with multitasking has undergone a transformation in just the last 10 years. Multitasking used to be a four-letter word just 10 years ago. Mothers would tell their children, don't do two things at once. And now they tell them, why don't you have another window open on your screen? Multitasking is something that we now know is occurring all around us. Our technology addresses multitasking, whether we like it or not. It's an entirely new environment for the individual and even more so for communities. Put the death of distance along with the death of time and realize that center is dying as well, that the network is constructed to circumvent centers. The network is, is constructed in such a way that any single point is no longer the crucial point. And the network works around single located problems by using packet switching. This means that censorship is no longer viable. It means that the nation state is becoming less important. It means that centers of authority, such as parents and professors and generals, are no longer as centrally powerful as they used to be, making for a fascinating world, some of which is very promising, some of which is very menacing, and all of which leads us to thinking about digital gaps, thinking about the difference between the haves and the have-nots, not in a material, tangible sense, but in the sense of access and skills and in the sense of being connected. The digital gaps in a networked world encourage us to think about network measurements. We need to teach as much as we used to teach about central tendency and about variance, we need to teach about network analysis. This is becoming an important determinant of who we are, what we can achieve, and what we cannot achieve or are not doing. So point number three is the death of the classroom. I grew up in an environment where you learned, and then if you were lucky enough, you taught in the classroom. I am now in an environment where one of the most maligned social structures is this idea of a sage on a stage because the sage is not that sagacious, the stage is not that useful, and the audience is not that attentive. And you can get much more information. You can get a lot more horizons broadened. You can get your curiosity piqued. And in fact, younger people are learning that the classroom is no longer where you go to seek knowledge. The classroom is becoming rapidly a solution for babysitting much more than a solution for knowledge. And if you add to that the fact that the classroom is being flipped, where instead of bringing people in for many hours a day of lectures and sending them home with a little bit of homework, we should send the lectures home and bring them in to meet with each other and interact and teach each other and do peer learning, then flipping the classroom is the backdrop for a new system of knowledge. This new system of knowledge needs to develop in a context where memory is no longer that important. I still remember phone numbers of girlfriends from back when I was 16. I don't remember phone numbers for my sons. Memory is no longer useful the way it used to be, and we remember a whole lot more. And if you add to the fact that memory can be placed on a disk on key, and the only problem with the disk on key is not its cost, because that's near zero, and not its size or volume, because that's growing exponentially. The only problem with this disk on key is which side you put it in. Uh, so you need to try twice, twice or three times. The only problem with memory no longer becoming a human trait is that we are at, we're challenged to ask, what does it mean to be human? If it's not memory, if it's not what we recall, then what is it? it is to be human, then maybe we can challenge both memory and death. If we can leave everything that we know, think about, feel, intend on some control C, control V resource, 
that is copied, then maybe we can do other things. Certainly, I'm not the only one thinking about this. The ideas of the death of death are resounding. Some of them are kooky and uh, are not going to happen. Some of them are already happening faster than we believe. The point is that death and life itself need to be considered in the context of the myth, death of memory. And if memory and death are no longer what we used to think they were, what about truth itself? Truth itself, as we know, is challenged by fake news all around, and certainly the internet has a big role in this. But truth also is being challenged by the very rapid rise in the importance of algorithms. Algorithms determine everything that happens around us and will be determining more. They determine selection and choice, they determine motion, they determine wars, they determine taxes, they determine the economy, they determine everything. Our choice, which used to be uh, maybe our single most defining characteristic, our choice is going away. We are facing a new environment, an environment where uh, Memory doesn't matter that much. Choice is no longer in our hands. And as a result, the very activity of this institution, universities, is being rewritten. If classrooms are discovered to be not the most efficient way or the most just way to teach, and if memory isn't that important, and if the tangible is being replaced by the intangible, why not do a flipped classroom solution with massive online open courses? And it's happening, as you know. We already have universities with millions of attendees, and we're playing this game here as well. We developed a MOOC three years ago, attended already by several thousand students from 70 different countries. It's running now in its third iteration. It's the sort of teaching that I couldn't have dreamed to have done before the availability of MOOCs. MOOCs are, have their problems. There's some real questions about uh, some real issues with massive online op open courses, but I'd like to suggest to you that traditional universities such as this disregard MOOCs at their own peril. They need to realize that uh, tsunami is coming. Conversation is longer, no longer what it used to be. We talk to many more people with a lot less eye-to-eye -eye contact. We have a whole lot less fam family dinners around the same table. We have a whole lot less intimate interactions with our peers. And yet, we talk to many more people all the time. This picture would have been a weird picture 10 years ago, and it's now commonplace. This is life. This is what you face when you look at a, uh, at a classroom. Most people are lost in their screens. This is how families celebrate their holidays. I've lit Hanukkah candles for the last three years with my family spread around the, gold, around the globe over Skype, and so on and so forth. Not only is conversation now being mediated by screens and nets, uh, the, our very language is evolving. Uh, these are words, they're some of the most common words in our conversation and discourse that didn't exist 10 years ago. And they are now familiar to everyone, and commonplace in our conversation. In Hebrew, I will say, Eliezer ben Yehuda mi egol afar menecha, with this uh, uh, new form of language. If there's a new form of language, we might not know it, because there's also a new basic conception of what privacy is. The notion of uh, being left to your own devices, of having an autonomous and separate presence is disappearing, if it ever really existed. Privacy is lost in a world where everyone is under a video camera, and the video camera not only records, it also deciphers. It identifies who's in the picture, and where, what picture were they in before, and what are they likely to be doing next. They are also recording everything that people say. In other words, conversations are no longer private, even if you think they're private. And the net result is that what we used to think as the other human element, in addition to conversation, in other words, communities, this notion of communities is now taking a completely different form. And technology is playing a very important role in it. In our center, we're doing quite a few 
projects related to building technology around and in the service of communities. Because even if distance is no longer the major factor, in other words, communities are not necessarily co-located. Even if time is no longer an important factor, in other words, we can have asynchronous communities, not just synchronous communities. Even if memory is not what it used to be, we need to think about using and constraining technologies in ways that serve communities and online discussions. One big project we're involved in right now is trying to build technology that would invite the public to take a much more active part in long-term strategic planning for urban development in Israel. A challenge that is really interesting, how do you get 8 million people to express their opinions in ways that are more functional than elections? That was the sentence I thought about before last week, but now uh, much more pertinent. And lastly, the death of promise. I wish I had time to talk about it, but I just say uh, it's pink because we used to think about the promise of this technology in pink terms. We used to think about a lot of optimism, a lot of optimistic scenarios that could come from a technology that would be accessible to all, make knowledge and information freely available, make connections between people, but this technology also carries a lot of threat. And there might be just as much a death of the promise as there is a revival of it. This optimistic poster from World War II times, we can do it, might be replaced by the same picture, the same pose, but this time someone taking a selfie, taking the promise and making it something a whole lot less interesting. Subjects of these eight topics that I mentioned are uh, covered in a lot of literature, many books, some of them uh, I wrote, so the book is not entirely dead, but we're still writing books. Uh, there's also a lot of movies, Hollywood is very uh, busy making movies about these questions, and as time goes by, not just science fiction, but social critique and criticism take uh, a role in this. There's a theater about this. Here at the, at the Haifa Theater, there's a uh, show going on called uh, How to Get Up from a Chair that is about the role of YouTube and finding out how to do anything, even simple things like getting up from a chair. All of these fall in this, all of these fall into the arena of uh, what I'd like to suggest are eight dimensions to think about with the issue of the network, tangibility in the book, deaths, distance, and distance, time, and center, the classroom, the issue of memory and death, the issue of choice and truth, the issue of conversation, the issue of privacy, and whether or not we're delivering on the promise. So whether it's utopia or dystopia, whether it's new technology is taking us in uh, sad directions or positive directions, I think it is our responsibility as scientists, and as people who ask questions, to follow these eight questions, to do maybe a little bit like uh, this concerned mother who uh, is worried about uh, her child uh, turning uh, glazed-eyed uh, at uh, this being fixed at the screen. But also remember that this uh, advice that the mother gives the child, it's a beautiful day, uh, really wants you to go outside, might be followed by this good child <laughs> acting on her advice. Oops. So uh, I thank you. <laughs>